everybody, we are live on Environmental Coffee House, and I am with Ian Golden. He is running in the 23rd District of Western New York. He is running for the seat of Tom Reed. Tom Reed is the guy that you know from me going to his town halls, doing those um, live streams and asking Tom Reed, those our congressman, those uncomfortable questions. Well, this is Ian. Ian is running in the primary against several other candidates. I thought it would be great to bring Ian on and familiarize Ian with everybody in the United States and maybe the world, because you don't know, we may have our next amazing person here. So Ian, why don't you tell us a little about you? Sure. Yeah, it's great to be here, Sandy. Uh, thanks so much for the opportunity. Um, as you mentioned, yeah, I'm running for the uh, 23rd Congressional District for the U.S. House. I'm a small business owner. Uh, I have two wonderful daughters, six and eight, which are most of the reason why I'm running. Uh, and um, yeah, it's been quite the process the last few months, uh, and it's it's great to be here. It is. It's great to have you. So, Ian. Why don't you start with telling us how and why, how and why you have decided to do this? What is your impetus for running? I think my impetus is just things are really messed up uh, on so, I think, many levels. And, and I think I could only sit back and, and hope that the change was going to happen um, before I really uh, needed to, to step up and be part of the change. And I'm, you know, really genuinely uh not okay with the direction that the world's going uh having two children uh and so it's it was time for me to really step up and, and to try to be the change um like you i was mm -hmm. a big uh bernie person and that's kind of what brought me back into seeing that there was i think a possibility for the power again to kind of rest with the people where i kind of was disillusioned by the system prior uh and so here i am i think trying to collectively be the change uh so yeah. Good. Well, yes, a lot of us uh, that follow Environmental Coffee House also were Bernie people, but there are people that were supporting the Democratic candidate because of mm -hmm. the Trump policies. And as we've yeah. seen, the Trump White House has not done a very good job with and what I wanted to ask you was, would you comment briefly on your view of the pick for the DEC, Scott Pruitt, uh, the things that you see that as a congressman, you may be able to change in the future? What yeah, I mean, I think Pruitt is just one example of... Um kind of the system as a whole that they really hope is, is not even just them, right? It's not even the current administration. It's the past 40 years of um, basically neoliberal policies, you know, whether it's Democrats or whether it's Republicans, you know, there's just a, a certain process of uh, decreasing regulations and shifting everything as much as they can to the private sector. And kind of here we are and, and where we've arrived. And I, I think the, the, debt, the, the selection of Pruitt is just a part of that. I mean, you know, very obviously conservative. I mean, you look at the home state, I think it was something that Walter Hang had posted. Uh, Walter Hang from Toxics Targeting had posted a map of uh, Oklahoma prior uh, and the result of uh, the fracking and the various um, waste sites. And it was crazy. I mean, like every dot, I think, uh, like red dot on the map or whatever indicated a, a toxic site, basically. And the state was literally, it seemed like a third full of those dots. Um, it's just insane, but, you know, but if you're looking at, you know, somebody to uh, basically continue to shift everything to uh, the private hands and the fossil fuel industries or whatever that they, ha you know, that they have been the past X amount of decades now, then I mean, this is the ultimate arrival of, of that process. And, you know, I think he's just a symptom of a much larger problem. Hmm. Well, all right, let's go, let's segue then from, from that into, um, your views of, you know, getting into that environmental, we're a fracked, a banning of fracking state, mm -hmm. and we don't want that back. Mm -hmm. So what would you say, what would you do as a congressman when that does come up again? How would you get consensus with your fellow congressmen that 
may not have the same ideas that you have? Yeah, that's a good question. My hope right now is, you know, as I'm going across the uh, the district and interacting with other groups uh, across the nation, I mean, people are so engaged right now that uh, I'm hopeful that at least a wave of us will make it through. You know, maybe I will, maybe I won't, but, but a wave of us will. And so hopefully it'll be easier to begin uh, working on some of the progressive uh, solutions and caucuses and, and to really push what we'd all, I think, like to see forward. Um, in terms of when I get there and how I'm going to go about that, I don't know yet. I mean, I, I haven't been there, um, and I'm also not, you know, there's, I think there's too much, uh, I think, concessions uh, being made. I mean, I, I get things that need, things that um, a lot of policies need to move forward with uh, kind of meeting in the middle. You know, you, the, our current congressman, you know, is pitching as hard as he can this Problem Solvers Caucus, and, well, you know, I'm, some things I'm not necessarily willing to, I think, meet in the, the middle on. Uh, mm -hmm. Fracking would be one of the, the one of those, I think. You know, I'm, I. But let me back up. I, I think to a certain extent, uh, we've lost too much uh, as um, just neighbors, let alone politicians. I think the ability to really uh, connect uh, and empathize uh, with our neighbors, to get on the ground and have those relationships and have those discussions. And we just get pitched into these Republican or liberal and divided camps and we just lose the ability to relate and empathize. And so, you know, mm -hmm. I think I've always so for me, myself, I worked uh, my wife and I worked with a shale shock uh, in uh, in Ithaca. Uh, we lived a bit outside of in Enfield and we did the door to door canvassing. And, you know, we talked about the fracking and, you know, the. Uh, potential impacts of the fracking and, you know, wanting to move off of that. And here are the reasons. But I really wasn't one to, I think, um, come down on too hard for some of the people that, you know, didn't necessarily share my views. And I feel like for some of them, in a lot in our district, I know there's a lot of people that are just not in a good place, maybe economically or uh, in some of the communities where there's not a lot necessarily going for them. And if they're really looking to put food on the table and feed their kids or to try to, you know, get out of an economic hole, I, I feel like it's, you know, I can't blame them for taking advantage of a big lucrative offer, uh, especially if they don't necessarily have an environmentalist kind of underpinning. Uh, so mm -hmm. first, I feel like I, I've got to I think understand where they're coming from um, and, you know, respect them as an individual who, again, maybe just be trying to feed their family. Uh, you know, so if we can get to the point where, you know, we can find solutions that will still uh, offer them sim similar benefits, whether it be, you know, uh, solar or wind or, you know, I drive through the district and I, I'm, um, so one of my first political meetings, and sorry if I'm just kind of ranting here on you, Sandy, but so one of my first political meetings okay, was going into... Okay, I like free association. All right, cool. All right. <laughs> so it was going into to Hornell was one of my first uh, meetings. And uh, my wife and I were both investors in the Black Oak Wind Farm uh, in Enfield, uh, which didn't get off, off the ground. Uh, and they tried for, for years and years, and it just didn't happen. And you know, everybody, you know, pegs Ithaca as all these crazy Ithaca hippie liberals, but... You know, come on, you know, to a certain extent, we've still got the, the knot in my backyard, even when it comes to some of these issues. And it's, it's tough to make it, you know, happen. And so here I was, I was driving to a first political meeting in, in Hornell and I was driving up over the ridge and uh, uh, crossing right by uh, one of the newer or relatively newer wind farms. Uh, and it was really, I think, a good feeling because it was leaving this again, in theory, this hippie Ithaca place and coming into <laughs> Uh, more of the central district in western New York. And here's this big, beautiful wind farm. Uh, and I'm guessing that, you know, the, the, I would guess that a lot of the landowners who were um, hosting those turbines, they weren't doing it because they were environmentalists and they weren't doing it because they were, you know, liberal Democrats. It's, it mm -hmm. it kind of made sense and it was an ec economic opportunity for them. And, and so I feel like, you know, we can still give those landowners those same opportunities that, you know, it, it would just be in a different way. And we, again, we're not doing it because we're environmentalists. We're doing it because it makes sense for our communities. And I feel like that's where it's going to be the way forward uh, with some of this uh, uh, move toward a, maneuver, a more of a renewable uh, infrastructure and grid. Well, I like that. You know, I do like that because the label, I don't like labeling, like uh, somebody calling you know, this candidate, well, a, a liberal or uh, I mean, I do like the word progressive, but 
I don't like the labeling, like you said uh, before. Um, so let's uh, segue from that then into economic opportunity then, you're, you're, mm -hmm. you're especially in these areas in District 23, uh, Allegheny County. We don't have a lot of economic opportunity, but I can see maybe bringing in the renewables here. Have you thought about that mm -hmm. in... in your position yeah at all. yeah I, I i think that that would i'm sorry you said bringing the renewables here is that what you said yeah yeah I, totally um you know but but then you look at the and so when you look at my uh website and i've got the the do list and my you know so i, I started with the the corruption in government and the money in politics i feel like you know if we can't begin to rein that in, we can't really get anywhere with the other things that we want to do, you know, so whether it be economic, whether it be environmental, whether it be social justice, whether it be education, everything is just impacted by uh, where we're at with the corruption of our politicians and government. So I started there, then I went to the economy, and then I went, went to the, uh, the health care. Um, but the economy, I was really seeing these renewables as part of just trying to bring the communities uh, into where they need to be, but also where they're going to be going forward. Uh, but you also see some of the, um, well, you see two things at work, right? I mean, you see some of the uh, maybe subsidies uh, that have been put forth through uh, the prior administration, making some of the, uh, the uh, renewables uh, more possible. Um, but you also see uh, other nations, so like China. Um, one of your friends, uh, Curtis Eisenhardt, which has helped me uh, quite a bit in the background, um, sent me a link uh, a couple of evenings ago to a, a YouTube video. I'm forgetting the name at the moment, but it was just talking about the uh, how much China has put into uh, their renewable industry, specifically solar. And I think they have one million jobs. I think that they've created in uh, creating these solar uh, panels, but it was they showed you the bell curve of what it took to get there. And it was really expensive in the beginning and they were taking big mm -hmm. losses, but they knew that year to year, like five years, 10 years, however long it took, that you were gonna mm -hmm. get to the point where it was suddenly viable. And so here was a country that was, you know, to a certain extent dealing with uh, ramping up their uh, manufacturing and uh, with larger pollution, pollution issues uh, harder than some other areas, but they were doing it to the point where they could get to a production capacity, which would allow them to shift to renewables. And they did it by directly investing in this with that intention. And so that I just don't see, you know, in our country. And then you hear, you know, our country complain that, you know, the, uh, the market's being flooded by solar panels produced in China. Well, I mean, that was that would to the benefit of China. They're only flooding it because they made the investment in solar and renewables. Uh, so if we're going to do it, then there needs to be more right legislative uh, consensus and push to let's make this happen. You know, it may not necessarily make money in the mini beginning. It's going to take a lot of federal investment uh, down through, but that's what it's going to take to get there. Uh, and, but it's getting close, right? I mean, it's more uh, almost uh, par neutral uh, with some of the um, uh, the fossil fuels. Uh, but now we're just dealing with, well, how do we work it into a grid that's been intentionally uh, filled up with the, uh, you know, fossil fuel industry? And, uh, you know, and so then, you know, how to work mm -hmm. through that is a whole different complication. But uh, so several layers, uh, I think, to getting to, to the renewables, I think. Okay. All right. So mm -hmm. then I want to segue then from that into the whole um, pipeline Thing. Uh, mm -hmm. The Northern Access Pipeline here was a big issue, and uh, I was involved in that. So were so many people from all over. But Allegheny County, our concerned citizens from Allegheny County, the group, what are your thoughts of this expansion of pipelines the industry yeah. is, is pushing through? What do you think? Yeah. Yeah. So for, from my vantage point, I think it, it comes back to I don't know, maybe you'd have a few people that are just for some reason, just love fossil fuels. And that's just kind of their thing. But I would guess that most people out there are really doing it because they're equating it with with jobs and building and growth. And um, and, you know, so that becomes lodged into, you know, if there's. For instance, environmentalists coming out and shutting down this pipeline, you know, to them, they're like, well, you're you know, what does it mean? It means I can't, you know, feed my family or something to that effect. And, and so 
I feel like we need to, again, be sure that we're at least understanding and empathizing of, of where they're coming from. I mean, if I can't empathize uh, with that person uh, who literally may, you know, lose a job or their, you know, family may be out, then I'm clearly not going to get anywhere with uh, communication or trying to make inroads. Um, but I think what's also um, very possible is, you know, that we continue on um, connecting on, you know, what those pipelines do mean uh, for those families and those communities. And then we start to discuss, all right, well, are there other ways to go about that and how do we make that happen? And, and you know, we could get into numbers of, uh, you know, the wind farms, the solar projects and, you know, how many jobs they create uh, once they're, well, I think, uh, so a friend that was working on the Black Oak project uh, sent me some stats of the various uh, uh, renewable projects that are happening in the southern tier in terms of megawatts and in terms of jobs created and, and how much uh, business uh, each of the turbines that goes in uh, injects into the local economy um, and then how many jobs uh, each one keeps after the fact. Um, and it's, it's on par and greater than the fossil fuel industries, you know, but it's, but again, if we come at it from an environmentalist vantage point, then I feel like it makes it a lot tougher to, uh, I think, make those inroads, inroads rather, you know, if we come at it from the, the different vantage point of, no, we get it, we get it's about jobs, we get it's about injecting uh, income into our communities, then, you know, then, then we're meeting on the same, uh, same, you know, playing field there, and we're no longer necessarily, you know, divided. Um, and so, again, I think it comes back to connection and empathy and uh, communication. And, you know, and if we can't do that, I mean, never mind the environment, we're just kind of screwed, you know, and, and that's kind of where we're at at the moment. Mm hmm. Well, on the comments, I see that you are popular. <laughs> this is good. Free flowing discussion. And everybody seems to really like it. Uh, if you want, how about... Um, Tell us what what is your your favorite aspect of running for Congress? What is the favorite thing, the thing in your heart? It doesn't have to be environmental. What is under under it in your heart? Let us hear. Uh, I think honestly, it uh, it would be really trying to do all that I can uh, to create a better uh, future for my for my daughters. Um, you know, I could only sit back and, and talk and again and hope for the change so long. Um, but I, you know, that falls short in terms of actually trying to do something about it. So, you know, when it really comes down to it at the, the core root of why I'm here, um, it's that I don't want uh, this, the division that's in our, uh, in our communities right now. It's not the world that I want for my daughters. Uh, and so that's, that's probably first and foremost what's at least in my heart of why I'm running. So going from there then, what would you say, uh, well, there's how many, there's how many people are running five or six in this, in this thing? Yeah, there's, there's six in the primary and then another one that hasn't uh, necessarily declared. And then I actually just heard there may be a, another one in the mix as well. So yeah, it's a lot, but it also speaks to, I think the engagement uh, that we're seeing all over the place. And, I know there are some, I think, more of the established, uh, I think, so I'm not, I don't have a background in uh, politics. I'm, again, a small business owner. Um, so I'm excited that there's so many people in the primary. I, I think it speaks to the engagement uh, across our country, let alone district at the moment. And I think that mm -hmm. we're all going to be doing pretty effective uh, jobs at reaching uh, maybe a greater audience. Uh, and I'm excited that we'll be a more effective uh um, body once the primary is over to really work toward the common goal. So, yeah, I, I'm excited about the engagement and I'm excited about where we're going. Okay, good. So, Ian, given that, uh, you know, you just discussed those, those things, you know, I'd like to actually go to something that's not so environmental, but it has to do with environment really is our health. Mm -hmm. And it has to do with how we get care. And with all yeah. of the uh, environmental toxins and everything that we're exposed to, I'd like to hear your thoughts from that kind of position. Your thoughts on for everybody in the United States coming from the fact that we are being poisoned every day. How do you think? What do you think? Yeah. Um, you know, well... Yes, uh, are being uh, 
poisoned uh, every day. And again, so much comes back to, I think, the uh, nature of the economy that's been created around us. Um, again, until we can rein in some of the uh, kind of the power, the corruption, uh, it's tough to, wow, um, kind of rein in some of the polluters, uh, let alone just about it being, you know, settlements with those polluters, right? I mean, because kind of the damage is already done. And then there's maybe some sort of precedent set with retribution, which is a drop in the bucket for the, uh, you know, the profits that are rolling in for these companies. And you're never really getting to the underlying issue of, you know, mm -hmm. why there's so much pollution. And, and, you know, so, but in terms of the healthcare, right, I'm, uh, you know, that's a, a mess as well. Um, you know, it's, you know, you, you spoke about in terms of how we're being polluted, but, uh, and the sicknesses that are coming from that. And that's a very real issue. Uh, but even, you know, beyond that, in terms of just the nature of our healthcare. Um, and so for instance, you know, what's being out there now in terms of the proposals from the current administration, I think, you know, everybody, well, I shouldn't say everybody, but I think the collective agreement for most would be that the uh, health care proposals that were put out were a total mess. And um, if it's hitting home, my wife would have any number of uh, pre-existing conditions that would make it very difficult under other systems to get care. Uh, one of her medications uh, is getting billed out to insurance at $1,000 per month, where it would be $30 in Canada. I mean, things are really, you know, really messed up. Uh, and when you get back to the idea of pollution and making us sick, Oh, man, even establishing the, um, you know, the responsibility for that pollution, the sickness. And, who, you know, you had mentioned when we were talking prior, just the issue with uh, one specific, like with the cell phone towers, right, in terms of the radiation. You know, it, you know it, if you could attribute the sickness or uh, whatever to, you know, the cell phone towers or to the cell phone industry, wow, what a, you know, behemoth uh, that even, again, if you could tie it back, uh, to being mm -hmm. able to establish that, you know, there's, there's a fault mechanism there, let alone to, I mean, I don't know what you do with that, right? Um, it's just such a huge, huge issue. And I don't have all those answers. Um, but it's pretty messed up. And, uh, you know, I'm, I hope to be part of the solution. And, you know, one thing at a time, but we'll get there, hopefully. Okay. Well, I think I'm looking at the comments and it really, you're, you're, everybody's comments are great. Um, they're the kind of men we need. You're the kind of man we need. I'm really excited. I mean, this is, this is great. I'm going to give this question to you from Curtis. Okay. Uh, he, it's backtracking, but what is the most efficient way to address climate change in your, in your estimation? No, uh, you from my estimation, it yeah, uh, from my estimation, uh, it would be to uh, make the investments needed to make uh, renewables and a renewable infrastructure uh, uh, doable uh, and make it, um, I think, be, again, um, cost equal to uh, some of the fossil fuels. I, I feel like that's some of the biggest hangups. And if we can make it where individual landowners are recouping some of that uh, benefit, um, and if we can invest enough where the uh, then the manufacturer becomes uh, even or even. So, in in Curtis, uh, thanks for chiming in. And I mentioned Curtis had sent me the link to the video that we had both uh, watched recently. Uh, and one of the examples, I think it was a huge solar array that was put in in uh, one of the uh, Middle East countries. Uh, and it was um, they had come out with I think the cost projection at being something to the effect of uh, like five dollars per per unit. Um, and they said to make it uh, to to get the fossil fuel, I think, price down to be viable against that solar array, it would have to come in with uh, like I think the barrels of oil are like ten to eleven dollars. And so basically, what they were showing was that we're hitting the tippet point of the renewables being uh, viable and being able to stand on their own, uh, even without the the subsidies. And I think that's that's absolutely what's needed to get us where we need to be environmentally, because again, you know, I don't, all the environmental, in, well-intentioned environmentalists in the world, you know, if we can't break down, I think, the economic barriers uh, and make it hit home and viable for people, I don't know if we'll get there fast enough. <laughs> That's cool. Well, I hope, Curtis, that was good and that answered your question. Um, we had talked a little bit about um, 
Well, actually, we've gone over pipelines. We've gone over some fracking issues. We've gone over some of your uh, health care um, things that you, you, you want to do about that. Um, single payer, a little bit more. Maybe we could talk about single payer. Sure. Um, but I just want to see if there's any more questions. But Ian, if you had something you want to say, and you've got this audience, you want to say about your candidacy and how we can get that message through to the 23rd district, because we are a conservative district. We do have um, one part of our district is very, is, is progressive, but we are for the most part conservative. What is the mm -hmm. message that you can get through to some of these people that perhaps voted for Trump, but are disaffected, did yeah. not like, what, what is it that you're, give it to us. Um, I think that I agree that uh, a lot of our communities have been left behind. And it's not just left behind by uh, the Republicans or Democrats. It's left behind by uh, the system uh, that's imposed its you know, economic policies uh, and any, everything else along with that over the past 40 years. So I agree. I, I think most of you uh, have been left behind. And I, I feel like you know, a lot of our you know, politicians are just corrupted by, you know, the big money that's keeping them there. Um, but it also allows them to, or doesn't allow them, I, I think, to even have any proactive solutions on on how to help those communities. You know, we're just mired in this, uh, again, economic model that, that doesn't work. Uh, and so for me, and, and, you know, what I have to offer is, you know, I'm, I'm not just out there to shake your hand and smile and you know, say to get your vote. I mean, I genuinely want to hear your concerns and I genuinely want to learn from them and I want to figure out uh, where we're, you know, we can go collectively. And so one of the things that I want to do a little bit different from uh, with my campaign is to, to try to switch the narrative of what candidates and what government and what we collectively are all doing for our communities. You know, I, I think the, mm -hmm. you know, the special election, for instance, in uh, Georgia, which pulled in whatever, $50 million dollars, uh, you know, it probably very, very, very little of any of that, that money that was put toward it did anything to benefit those communities, uh, anything whatsoever. And so what I'd like to do is to really connect with people across the district and just see where we can be of help. And I, and I want, instead of a wine and cheese party that's just out there to, you know, uh, bring money into my campaign to then exit to some other back door out of our community, I want us to come together and see if we can work on uh, something that would benefit the, the community on the ground. And if we're going to raise money, I want it to raise money that's going to help something in the community. Uh, and I feel like that's what's been lost in, in government, uh, is being able to work with and for the community. Uh, and so I think that's going to be a little bit different, and I'm excited. You know, I don't know where that's going to go and whether it's going to catch, but at least I will come out of it uh, working for the communities rather than just taking from the communities. Wow. Okay. Cool. Well, we do have a question, but we, I know we talked about this earlier, Ian. Um, there is somebody that's asking about the CPV fracked gas plant in, down in Minisink, which is in Orange County. If you were familiar with uh, Pramila and James Crom Cromwell getting uh, involved in Protect Orange County, if, which is it's a big thing. It's a, it's a plant that will have terrible emissions and it, well, it's really bad for the neighbors and the community it's in a farming community what would you say if something like that was proposed here company coming in let's say it could be national fuel mm -hmm. gas or some big company coming in and jobs and making a deal with the governor or doing something like that as a company how do you think you could approach that? Uh, so from the uh, federal level, uh, what I guess I would do is uh, to try to be on the ground with the communities. You know, I don't know whether that ends up being more of a uh, state issue and a community issue. Uh, but what I can do is to be uh, an advocate, I think, for the communities. Um, I know that I wouldn't want that in my backyard. I wouldn't want it in my community's backyard. Um, and so wherever they're bringing it from, you know, I, I, you know, here's the problem, right? I wish that that waste, uh, was never created at all, you know? And, and so, you know, one 
fine reason why we really need to shift to renewables that aren't necessarily creating the waste. Not that there's not some waste that comes out of renewables, but it's not like that. Uh, and so, you mm-hmm. know, I wish it wouldn't have created to begin with. And wherever they did create it, you know, I wish they'd send it back there. Um, and I'm not sure what to tell them to do with it at that point, but I don't want it in my backyard and I don't want it in your backyard either. All right. Actually, I think we covered a lot. I, I, uh, I think uh, there was something I, think I, was- I suppose I want to ask, and that has to do with um, debating. Mm-hmm. And if you it, it, are they going to have debates with between the Democratic Candace? candidates? They plan uh, hopefully. That? hopefully we had uh, probably the closest that we've come was this past Tuesday uh, in Ithaca. The Tompkins County Democratic Committee hosted a candidates forum. And they had a question and answer session after where we had opening statements and then we uh, got to all answer uh, the questions and then we had a closing statement. So it was actually it was fairly close, um, I think, to a debate. And I I had fun uh, actually uh, doing it. Uh, So I hope that there will be more of those. Uh, And I'm getting up to speed. I'm trying as as hard as I can to uh, learn as much as I can in short order on, you know, on all of these topics. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if a debate was. Yeah, I'm getting there, and I and I had fun doing it. So hopefully there'll be more. Yeah. Okay. But I heard you, something. <laughs> you could host one. You know, you you could host one in your, uh, you know, in your backyard or you know wherever. Um, and I'm, you know, I yeah. can give you all the contacts of the candidates, and we could all come out. And, you know, I don't. This for sure doesn't have to be owned by Democratic committees. Uh, you know, this could be you know any of your groups. Feel free to. to uh, they asked to host one, and I'll see if I can get us to show up. If there's any questions, I would really like to have some from the audience, and I can't post them, so I'm looking. Oh, well, I will say Ed Ed Summer says I'd vote for him all day long. That's a good one. I'd like that. I'd like to hear our constituents in the Thank 23rd you, District say that, too. That would be awesome. You, Ed. What do you think? <laughs> what would you like to say in closing? to our audience and this is going to be shared all over the internet so uh we're introducing ian golden to the united states of the world on environmental coffee house take it away and what would you like to say so really i just want to say i'm thankful i'm thankful for the opportunity to uh chat with you here uh tonight sandy i'm thankful for those of you have tuned in uh for those who have posted positive comments there i'm thankful as well um and i'm really hoping to run a more, I think, genuine and authentic campaign uh, than we see. uh, Well, we don't see it enough. Uh, And to do it, it's really got to be a collective effort. Uh, And I would love uh, to connect further with anybody who's out there and to get on the ground and in your communities. And, you know, if you're out of our our district, that's okay. You know, connect with me anyway. Uh, Let me know what's important to you. And, you know, let's figure out a model going forward that uh, brings us together rather than splits us apart. And, and let's keep doing this. Let's keep chatting. Great. All right. Well, this has been a great interview. Um, we got a lot of really good um, commentary. Uh, Golden for Congress. Of course, that's Curtis. <laughs> and Curtis sure. is your, uh, your right hand. Curtis, his name is Curtis Eisenhart. And he is Ian's right hand. And he is really awesome. All right. Well, I am going to say thank you so much for coming on and talking and talking from your heart. It's really been a pleasure. And we're going to do this again. We're absolutely going to do this again. Ian, thank you so very much. Yeah, thank you very much. This has been really actually wonderful. Great, thanks. Okay, everybody. So good night. Thank you for coming. Share, get Ian's name out. Ian Golden for Western New York 23rd District against Tom Reed. He's got to win in the primary first, though. So we've got to get this going. Thank you very much. Everybody have a wonderful night. And thank you, Ian. We'll talk again. Thanks, Andy. Bye-bye.